Thank you. Okay. So uh, you know that I like to talk, but um, I don't have much time. And I think that most of the things that I wanted to say have been either said completely or introduced by the previous speakers. There's a tremendous amount of coherence in everything that has been said so far today. But I'm going to talk on a very important subject, and that is social protection floors and what is the role of the public services. So there are some things that you will just have to bear with me. I will walk through. So the first thing I want to talk about is we talked about the tension between the advances in health secu security and progress in health de development. And I agree with um, Amit, who is not here anymore, or he left, or ah, 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 OK. So it is very much. Um, a division between those who have and who want to protect what they have against incursions, those horrible incursions of diseases from the South, um, and those who really have never achieved health systems where they can afford the luxury of, of health security. Um, and the only reason they ever see health security is to protect the people who have, much to their dismay. But I would like to set that tension aside for the moment, because what I really think is critical is the fact that there is a need for all economies, whether they're least developed or more developed, to place health in the space of individual security where health and social protection meet. And that's basically my main message. So why is that? Um, I thought about this on four, I asked myself four questions, because I like to go back to basics. And the four questions I asked are, what is the scope of health? What are the objectives that guide health policy? What inputs are needed? And what resources are needed? And in speaking to my own questions, I arrived more or less at the position that I would like to convey to you today. First of all, my premises, these are important. This is where I come from. I think you need to know in which uh, spirit I thought about these questions. First, I wanted to be more idealistic than pragmatic. Secondly, more long-term than short-term. Thirdly, uh, I am very concerned about the values and principles that underlie uh, health thinking in general. <clears throat> and I would say that those, it is those principles and values that allow us to generalize from one situation to another. So we don't spend our entire time just putting out fires. But we think, step back and think about really underlying problems. <clears throat> and the way that we approach them can allow us to approach other problems as well. And the fourth thing I feel strongly about is that we need to be proactive. We need to be open-ended. Our thinking has to be open-ended. We never arrive at conclusions. The thinking keeps on going. And we have to be anticipatory, forward and future-oriented. So in thinking about that and putting the, the two issues in context, that is public services and social protection floors, I find that the scope of health under both the WHO Constitution of 46, which inspired the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it did precede it, that's an important thing to know. There is already no separation between economic and social well-being and health. There is none. It's a fake separation. It's a non-existent wall. Under the WHO Constitution, we talk about social well-being, and incidentally, they also talk about mental health, which is really critical, and this gets forgotten a lot. And in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's even more clearly stated. It's the right to a standard of living that's adequate for health. And that includes necessary social services and the right to security. And what is the security? It's income security. It's in the case of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, et cetera, et cetera. It is basically a social protection. So here we have the basic instruments of public international law that deal with health equally deal with economic capacity. So I got to the second question. And what are the potential objectives of health policy? Well, the first one you find is peace and order. It's very defensive. And incidentally, that's fundamental to health security. This is what the G20 ministers are going to say. And they think that the people who listen to them, that is the electorate of these countries are more concerned about being protected from uh, health incursions from poor countries than they are about the general well-being and the good state of health of the world. 
And I think as citizens of different countries, we need to, we really need to express quite clearly to our governments that we're far more interested in far broader issues than just protecting our borders from people who arrive and who have to have their temperature taken because they may have Ebola. So I think this is really important. So I move to the second proposal, which is that health for all as a normative goal. And that has been basically the guiding principle of the World Health Organization since Alma Atta. Almaty, the, the, the original discussions about health for all. And it continues to be. The language has changed. It's a little bit modified in the sustainable development goals, but it's still a concern. Those two words appear everywhere, health and all. It's not health for some, <laughs> it's health for all. And this is a positive goal. So adding a little bit to that, I would say that potential objectives of any health policy has to be that it's proactive, it's principled, it's positive, it has a positive objective, and very importantly, we've heard this already today, I told you you've heard everything before, it has to be politically willed. It has to be the, the objective of our governments, and therefore of our entire democratic processes. So, what inputs are needed? Well, I, I think you know them all. Infrastructure, a system of delivery, qualified people in enough numbers, supplies, equipment, technical know-how, research and development to raise standards, and edu importantly, education of personnel and of users. Of all of these, I'd like to insist on the education of users. Uh, we just don't do enough of it. For some reason, we think it's throwaway money to educate the public about public health, to teach them that antibiotics have there are both antibiotics that work for bacteria and there are antibiotics that are called antivirals that work on viruses. And to teach them what a cold is, a cold is a virus, it's not a bacterium. There's a whole bunch of very, very basic health information that is simply never taught. It's not taught in school. There was a time when it used to be taught in school. It, you never see billboards. There's no um, public-minded uh, advertising for, for health. It occurred for a short time during the AIDS epidemics, there was good information being provided in all forms, billboards, paper form, and you just don't see it anymore. I mean, we had a very, very short period of Ebola information, which was just bad in any case. So yeah, I, I really do think this is critical. So my last question, what resources are needed? Well, I could only find four. The first one is political will. The second is good governance, because you need to be able to implement the political will, and for that you need good governance. And incidentally, a major problem in most developing countries with their health systems is exactly that. They do get resources. You can't imagine the amount of resources that they get nationally from their own domestic sources and from ODA, Overseas Development Assistance, but they have very poorly functioning systems. It's poor governance. Knowledge capital, really important. It's, I think there's a lot of knowledge capital in this room. It's what all of us collectively know and continue to learn and continue to promote um, the development of. And finally, money. Well, that's no mystery. Money is very, very important to everything. So where are we now with public international law? We, we had the WHO Constitution. We had the... Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We had the Millennium Development Goals for 15 years, from 2000 to 2015. And incidentally, the most important thing in the Millennium Development Goals is not those eight goals themselves. The most important thing is the preamble to the Millennium Declaration, which was founded on principles. It stipulates principles of solidarity, of um, social justice, it's all there, and it's never, never mentioned. The declaration itself is a really unique document. I recommend that you look at it. So we've already seen that at, in 1946 and 1948, social, I mean, uh, health was indistinguishable. It was jointly promoted along with um, the means to achieve it, essentially the means to achieve it, either earning an adequate uh, um, uh, means of living or social services and uh, social security. 
It is no different in the Sustainable Development Goals. So under three, which is to ensure healthy lives, we have achieve universal health coverage. And incidentally, that's a language that is borrowed from insurances, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential healthcare services, and access to safe, effective, quality, and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. Again, we have an inseparability between health and risk protection and essentially access, very, very important word. I didn't bolden it there, but access is terribly important. But uh, this is where social protection comes in. This preamble, this preamble is essential. I don't have a, I can't walk away from here. Okay, so read the preamble. We recognize that eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions, including extreme poverty, is the greatest global challenge and an indispensable require requirement for sustainable development. That's in the preamble to the Sustainable Development Goals. So essentially, the most important goal, and it needs all the other goals to achieve it, is eradication of poverty, which is goal number one. And what is this third item on goal number one? Implement nationally appropriate social protection systems and measures for all, including floors, and by 2030 achieve substantial coverage. You can read the rest. So essentially, the most important, the most highlighted aspect of the sustainable goals, development goals, has to do with the implementation of social protection systems. Now, the social protection systems didn't come from nowhere. They came from my beloved international labor organization, which was spoken about by our, our colleague from the German um, unions. And what does it come from? It comes from Recommendation 202. And it was passed in 2012, and it, the timing was perfect because the language of the social protection floors was just blended into the Sustainable Development Goals as the language of the Sustainable Development Goals developed. And the process, if you remember, just started around the same time. And what do they say? That social protection floors have four components. The first one is access to a nationally defined set of goods and services constituting essential health care. Again, we have an indissolution between health and social protection and uh, ability to pay. The second is ba basic income security for children. The third is ba basic in some income security for all persons of active age who, for one reason or another, don't have another income. I've went, okay. And basic income security for older persons. So here again, we have a total inseparability between health and the means to achieve it. So I'm going to be very normative here. And I'm going to say that, in conclusion, health is a good that should be contracted between the state and each individual, founded on the two rights, the right to health and the right to Social Security. It should be immune from the ability to pay. It has to be universal, equally available. It has to be founded on values of redistribution and solidarity. It has to be subjected to the principle of public service, it, because that's the only place where you have the accountability and the transparency of national accounts, fiscal revenues, and public expenditures. And that's what you need. And very importantly, and this is where we all come in, it has to be governed by policy that emerges from processes based on consultation and ensured political participation and representation. It has to be a, a choice that is made by our societies. And we are the voters, and we should insist on that choice. It's affordable. It's totally affordable. I'm not going to go into those arguments. If you have questions about it, it is totally affordable. The World Bank says it is totally affordable. They've demonstrated it's affordable. It's been shown in many, many pilot projects, both of Familia in, in Brazil. What it does require is a reordering of priorities, and that's where it really, where, and that is a political process. It's a 100% political process. It's not a question of cost. Thank you. <laughs>